Good afternoon, good Sunday to you all. I hope you all are having a fantastic day. And boy, oh boy, don't we got a lot to talk about coming up over the next 10 days as we have a potential polar vortex that is going to be unleashing potentially some of the coldest air that we've seen in the past 10 or 20 years, potentially. Now, moving forward, we're going to look at all the models from the GFS to the Euro, show you all all the possible outcomes, not just one, and then go over the preliminary tornado reports as of yesterday that took place down in Texas, Mississippi, and Alabama. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Now, beginning with yesterday's tornado outbreak, we had a total of 39 preliminary tornado reports as of right now. Uh, wind reports about 156. Hell reports only about 12. Total reports as of yesterday, 207. And one of the strongest tornadoes that did touch down yesterday began its journey down here in the Galveston Bay area. And that is actually rated as a preliminary EF3 tornado, high-end EF3. And um, tracked over 60 miles from Texas all the way to Louisiana. Um, I was watching it, tracking it yesterday. Um, absolutely devastating. And thankfully, once it got past the Galveston Bay area, it went just south of Port Arthur's main city and population and really just did damage to the marsh lands. So unless you're living in the marsh way out in the middle of the water and swamps, then I'm pretty sure you're all right. But let's go ahead and dive in and look at some of the reports. All right, now diving over to yesterday's tornado reports, beginning with our main one that was rated a preliminary EF3. Um, reports started coming in just southwest of Alvin, Texas, and this is going to be our first report of Saturday, 12.57 p.m., multiple homes destroyed between Alvin and Liverpool. Our tornado then continues to move eastward. What is going on here? Let's zoom back in there. Our, conti our tornado continues to move eastward towards Dickinson area. Um, Saturday, 1.40 p.m. Central Time, multiple homes damaged in and around the Dickinson area. It then moves towards the Galveston Bay area as of Saturday, 1.45 p.m. Roof damage to homes near um, Bay Shoe Park area. Um, after this, we only got three more tornado reports because obviously we're getting to more of a marshland area. So not much as far as a population goes, which is a good thing. Um, Saturday, 2.26 p.m., a car was thrown by a tornado near Smith Point. Possible injuries. My prayers go out to all the people that were in the path of this course. Um, definitely a scary situation. It being rain wrapped and dark by the time it got to Port Arthur. Um, Saturday, 3.06, multiple homes, power lines down along Highway 24 as well. And our last report is going to be on Saturday, 3.25 p.m. Report of minor injuries as a motorist was caught in the tornado crossing Jefferson County earlier. So, obviously, this went on and moved into Louisiana and continued to do damage um, in less populated areas. And we do have other tornado reports. We're not going to go every single one because we'd be here all day long. Um, we did have another one yesterday around 10.40 a.m. in the morning. A tornado damage in Mobile Home Park near Knoll Lane, which is actually close to where I used to live, and then a couple up here in north of the Houston area, and then obviously a bunch more in the Mississippi and Alabama area. And I don't think this is going to be it. I think we're going to have another shot at severe weather right as this cold blast is coming down, this polar vortex that is potentially going to bring our... Um, Arctic air, record-breaking temperatures. So without further ado, let's dive into some of these models and kind of break down the timeline and the time frame and what we could expect moving forward. Alrighty, now beginning with our 850 millibar temperature anomaly, and we're going to start this around January the 5th. And you can see moving in time here, we've got this very cold below average Arctic air filling in in the north part of the United States. And as we push this in time here, you'll notice that the GFS model likes to take it down into pretty much all the way to Texas and all the way almost into Mexico by January the 7th to January the 8th. I think these two days between the 8th and the 9th are going to be the worst, at least for the more southern extent area as far as Texas goes. Um, like, don't worry. Florida is one of these models hold true. Florida is not going to miss out on this. Um, very well below average temperatures getting far south as Florida. Obviously, this is only one model run, but it's been pretty consistent over the past couple model runs. But obviously, the Euro does show something a little bit different, and the Euro has been a little bit more bullish as far as 
as how deep the Arctic air gets, especially for Texas, and how long it stays around. So let's jump over and let's take it the Euro model as well. All right, now taking a look at our 850 millibar temperature anomaly with the Euro model. Beginning around January the 3rd, you can see our polar vortex Arctic air below average temperatures filling in, um, getting ready to just burst down south to the lower 48. As we put this in time here, we're going to go to about January the 5th to the 4th, um, to the 6th, and you'll notice that the main difference between the GFS and the Euro model right now is that the Euro model has been hinting at a more central plains um, Arctic break or polar vortex. You know, the GFS has it more along the eastern part of the United States, heading more toward the east coast. This one likes to just take it right down the middle, not only right down the middle. I mean, look at this. I mean, like these pinks, these white colors, this is like really, really below average. This would be potentially historic if it did unfold like this. And I mean, it's not just going to be for one day from the, the 6th to the 7th to the 8th to the 9th, 10th. And then finally, it potentially moves out by January the 10th or 11th. Um, and then finally, we start getting a little bit of um, warmer air building back out into the west. But regardless, if the GFS is right, regardless if the Euro is right, we're still going to see pretty much some type of arctic air it might not be a polar vortex arctic air it might not be record breaking but regardless we know we can say with 100 percent confidence that we're going to see some type of freeze as far south as texas and potentially even florida all right now taking a look at our actual temperatures of what the temperatures could feel like basically um and this is going to be moving forward from january the 3rd to january the 5th and you can already see um cold arctic air already building in the northern plains north dakota south dakota almost single digits and we continue to move this forward here and we're going to take this to about january the 8th right about here all right this is about january the 8th um 12z all right um this is when that very cold arctic air starts pushing down we've got you know our high temperatures 28 degrees in Dallas, almost pretty much 32 degrees down here in the Houston area. Oklahoma, um, negative 2. Kansas, negative 6. These aren't even your feel-like temperatures. These aren't even your wind chills. These are actual, actual temperatures, and we continue to move this forward, and it's, it's pretty consistent. We start heating up a little bit, and like I said, I mean, the GFS has not been as bullish as how far south it's going to go down in here into texas it likes the east coast the gfs has always liked the east coast so regardless of what type of arctic air we have and how far it's going to go south i think that right now the gfs is pretty consistent with that but the euro has also been pretty good at forecasting more mid to long range um, model guidance when it comes to temperature guidance and things like that. But let's go ahead and jump over to the euro model. Alrighty, now you can see here with the euro model um, by January the 7th, I mean, a more widespread outbreak of Arctic air versus what the GFS has showed and a lot more colder. It's a lot more bullish. I mean, anywhere from down south to Kansas, negative eight, negative 10, you've got negative, you know, 20 degrees, your actual temperatures. This is by January January the 7th um, you're already freezing in northern Texas near the Dallas area and we continue to push this forward in time and we're going to stop it right about here around January the 9th and I mean it's it's we're frozen the whole the entire United States is almost completely frozen I mean you've got temperatures in the 20s 23 degrees all the way down in San Antonio um, almost single digits in the Dallas area like I guess these are actual temperatures so, I mean, with wind chills and the feels like, you're going to feel like you're in the negatives almost. Five degrees in the Texas Panhandle, and we continue to push this in time frame. Eight degrees, 13 degrees, 22 degrees near the Houston area, and it, it just it gets worse from there. So, like I said, worst case scenario, we see the Euro play out and the Euro is right. I obviously hope not. I would like some colder temperatures, but this is just pipe bursting, hypothermia, um, type temperatures and add on potential snow or ice that we could see down here in the south or really anywhere in the central United States to the east coast. Um, power outages with temperatures 20 to 15 degrees into the single digits. I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. So not to scare y'all, but I just want to kind of show y'all two different models that do pretty good um, when it comes to forecasting these type of events. 
Um, and obviously, right now, the one that's been pretty accurate is the one that's more bullish. All right, now, going over to the severe weather aspect, I think that we could see some severe weather between the time frame of January the 5th to January the 7th, right as that Arctic boss is coming down. We're going to have that cold air meeting up with this warm air down here in the south. We all know how that goes. Now, the only thing is the GFS doesn't really see that. The GFS is not really bullish on that. Um, you know, we really don't have that dip in the debt stream. We really don't see a negatively tilted trough that would, you know, indicate any type of severe weather so right as of right now the gfs really doesn't show anything bullish we do have a low level jet that's cranking above you know kansas at this time january the 5th about 109 knots but i mean as far as the shape of the trough and the jet stream it really isn't favorable even if some of the other kinematics and thermodynamics are there um, i don't think this would be seducive for 20 development as far as the gfs goes now, obviously, taking a look at the European model, this paints a different picture around the same time frame, January the 5th. This is our 300 millibar height, and this shows a big difference. I mean, we've got this dip in the jet stream potentially starting to become negatively tilted over the plains, and this would definitely spell a recipe for severe weather if all the other kinematics and thermodynamics are there. Obviously, CAPE, our convective available potential energy, and dew points as well. And we'll start to kind of break some of those details down moving forward once we get into more of a less of a seven day period because of right now we're still too far out to nail down any specifics but as far as the pattern and the pattern change that's coming it's definitely seducive for severe weather and definitely seducive for cold that's pretty much going to wrap it up for today's video, guys. I appreciate you watching. If you like the video, definitely like it. It helps out with the algorithm. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on bell notifications for future videos like these. We will be doing more storm chasing and on-the-ground coverage moving forward around April or May. So stay tuned for that, guys. I love y'all. I appreciate the support. And stay tuned for the next